Hello. Welcome to Watson Farley and Williams Transport webinar series, which is a collection of eight episodes covering the key topics in the aviation, maritime, and rail industries at the moment. Today's webinar is the final webinar in our three-part aviation series. We will be discussing private equity opportunities in aviation. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping notes. Please note that participant video and audio have been disabled to minimize interruptions. If you would like to pose a question or comment to any of our presenters, please use the Q&A function and we will either write a reply or respond during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, you can contact the speakers directly following the event. This webinar will be recorded. My name is Suzanne Burstein and I will be today's moderator. I am a partner in the Asset and Structured Finance Group at Watson, Farley & Williams, and I am based in New York. On our panel today, we are joined by Mark Mayohas. Mark is the founder and managing partner of Graybull Capital, an investment and holding company focused on special situations and growth opportunities in Europe and North America. Also joining us is Franklin Prey. Franklin is the managing director of Alinda Capital Partners. At Alinda Capital, Franklin manages an investment vehicle that focuses on tangible assets with a primary emphasis on fleet assets in the shipping, air, rail, intermodal, and industrial spaces. We also have with us Jim Bell, who is a partner in our asset and structured finance group based in London. Jim is also co-head of Watson Farley's aviation group. Last but not least, Pete O'Hare is a partner in Watson Farley's asset and structured finance group based in London. During this webinar, we are going to discuss private equity in aviation. We should start out by saying that when we refer to private equity, we are not referring to the private equity asset class, but rather to the investment management companies that raise funds from institutions and then invest that money by equity and debt into businesses. For our purposes, this would include hedge funds, venture capital funds, and distressed debt funds. Generally speaking, when we refer to private equity, we are referring to any form of private capital that exists outside of general banking or the capital market. The aviation sector has obviously been hit very hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Aviation participants, including airlines, lessors, and financiers, have sought to adapt and consolidate their positions, often seeking alternative sources of financing and investment. As such, there has been growing interest and investment from private equity in the aviation sector. So given that, and before we turn over to our guests, perhaps it's worth starting by giving some background to PE investment in aviation pre-COVID-19. Pete, do you think you could comment on that? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. So as you say, um, private equity isn't a new entrant to the aviation sector. Um, private equity firms were early investors into aircraft leasing, and many of today's aircraft lessors are, or were once, owned um, by private equity. Um, I'll just talk through a few examples of these investments into and the exits from um, aircraft leasing companies over the years. Um, first of all, Cerberus Capital Management, a US-based private equity firm, um, acquired Dutch-based uh, commercial aircraft vessel Debis Air Finance, later renamed Aircap from Daimler Chrysler in 2005 and took it public in 2006. Um, Aircap subsequently grew to be the largest aircraft lessor in the world um, through the acquisition of ILFC from AIG. Um, although is now number two to GCAS. Um, Cerberus successfully completed its exit from that investment in 2012. Um, Aircastle, uh, another commercial aircraft lessor, was founded by private equity firm Fortress Investment Group in 2004 and taken public in 2006. Um, Aircastle traded on the New York Stock Exchange until March 2020 when it completed a merger with its largest shareholder, uh, Marubeni and Mizuho Leasing. Um, in 2006, uh, Terra Firma, a UK-based private equity firm, acquired AWAS from Morgan Stanley. Um, in 2007, Terra Firma further agreed to purchase Pegasus Aviation uh, from the US private equity firm Oak Tree Capital Management uh, and combined AWAS and Pegasus to create the new AWAS, um, which was then the world's third largest aircraft lessor. Um, Terra Firma started its exit uh, from AWAS in 2015. Um, when AWAS sold a large portfolio of uh, 90 aircraft to Macquarie, once uh, close to my heart as I spent a, a good number of hours working on that transaction, uh, and their exit was completed um, when the remainder of AWAS was sold to Dubai Aerospace in 2017. Um, 
More recently, the lessor Avalon Aerospace Leasing uh, in Dublin was founded in 2010, backed by four leading international investors, um, Sinden, CVC Capital Partners, uh, Oak Hill Capital Partners, and uh, GIC, the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation. Uh, and that was successfully taken public in 2014. Um, in September 2015, Avalon announced that Bohai Leasing had made a cash offer for all of Avalon's common shares. Um, the acquisition was completed in January 2016 and the uh, company stock delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Um, there have also been a number of investments made through JVs and sidecars where investors can invest more directly into specific aircraft um, by way of example. Um, from June 2009, uh, Air Venture was a JV between Waha Capital and Aircap until October 2010. Um, when Waha Capital acquired a 20% stake in Aircap uh, in exchange for, for its 50% interest in the Air Venture JV, um, as well as other consideration, including a 40% stake um, in its own 16 aircraft portfolio and uh, $105 million cash. Um, Waha Capital divested its stake in Aircap uh, in December 2019. Um, we've, also seen, we've also seen other sidecars established more recently, uh, including in the helicopter space, um, for example, the LCI and Flexam co-investment vehicle for five Leonardo and Sikorsky helicopters. Um, finally, uh, private equity um, also makes investments into to other aviation companies, including airlines, um, such as Indigo Partners, ownership of budget airline Frontier in the US, also has major stakes in JetSmart in Chile and, and uh, Hungarian Wizz Air. Um, and of course, um, Crow Ball um, rescued Monarch in 2014. Um, and, and there are other um, PE investments into other aviation companies, such as airports, um, so it would include a lender's um, investment in Heathrow um, and, and other PE firms having investments in MROs and, and other such service companies. Um, so hopefully that's a, a good flavour of some of the ways PE uh, has invested in tuition um, prior to the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, obviously, due to the crisis, we're seeing a distressed aviation market, um, which means we're seeing new opportunities for PE to, to come into the game. Um, in some ways, it's similar to the depressed shipping sector um, which we saw in 2012. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Jim, can you tell us how these potential uh, new opportunities for PE compare to what we've seen in other sectors, for example, in shipping, as Pete mentioned? Thanks, Suzanne. Um, yeah, I think I think shipping is is probably the most useful comparison. Um, so to, to give some context in the shipping sector, so following the sort of global financial crisis, the sh shipping industry had a number of uh, issues. So world trade had reduced, leading to a drop in shipping activity. Uh, there was an oversupply of, of, of vessels. Uh, traditional lenders had looked to retreat from the market due to overexposure, uh, stricter capital adequacy requirements, and a general policy steer away from of the non-core assets. Um, by 2012, these, these issues had really sort of intensified and, and, and crystallized and led to sort of lower charter rates, um, lower asset valuations, debt of servicing became much more difficult, uh, loan to value ratios started to be breached, and as the banks pulled away, the shipping industry started to, to show sort of real signs of distress with a, a number of well-known shipping companies entering into chapter 11. Um, against this sort of backdrop uh, of, of low asset values, distressed debt opportunities, and, and the prospect of, of eventual recovery, uh, private equity funds started to, to invest heavily into shipping. So um, to give some sort of context on that, uh, private equity in shipping jumped to around $8 billion in 2013, and since then has, has expanded to over $20 billion. Um, to give a few examples of the types of investments, so um, WL Ross and a number of other funds uh, acquired Sido Shipping's entire tanker fleet uh, worth over a billion dollars. Uh, Carlisle and Tiger uh, formed a joint venture committing to invest a billion dollars in, in in the purchase of uh, in equity in the purchase of shipping assets. Um, Oak Tree provided sort of debt, um, so uh, it, it's a general maritime in its Chapter 11, which was then subsequently converted into equity uh, and formed sort of various joint ventures with other well-established shipping uh, operators. 
Um, and then, and then really the, the sort of big push was sort of Oak Tree, DK, Cerberus, KKR and, and others have purchased sort of huge swathes of performing and non-performing shipping loan portfolios. And I think this is helpful to note because there's some obvious parallels that can be drawn between the shipping sector in 2012, 2013 and the current issues we're facing in the aviation sector. Um, we obviously have a, a severe reduction in flights, a substantial oversupply, uh, oversupply of aircraft for what we need right now, um, potential tightening of traditional funding sources with people sort of banks potentially steering away from the market. Um, of course, much of this is temporary and, and, and linked to COVID, but I think everyone recognises that the knock-on effects might result in some level of sort of oversupply of aircraft for the coming years. That said, it is generally accepted that it won't take long for the aviation sector to correct itself um, with sort of huge forecasts for, so in, in the distance for, for sort of uh, the, the travel market uh, generally for aviation. Um, however, I suppose the sort of the, the lower asset values, distressed debt opportunities and the prospects of an eventual uh, recovery seems to marry very well with the 2012-2013 shipping sector issues and therefore might um, make for perfect private equity opportunities in the same way in aviation, which, which I think we've already started seeing. So as, as mentioned, PE covers a wide range of different investment strategies and interests. Franklin, perhaps I can start with you. Can you please explain Alinda Capital's investment strategy and summarize your investments in aviation pre-COVID-19? Hi, Suzanne. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, so our infrastructure fund makes equity investments in infrastructure in North America and Europe. So sectors of interest including or include digital infrastructure, utility-related infrastructure, transportation and logistics infrastructure, and our active investments in our infrastructure fund include Heathrow Airport and uh, the container port Virginia International Gateway. Uh, in the investment vehicle that I manage, um, we have a tangible assets focus. Uh, and in that, that tangible assets investment focus, um, we really focus on a global equipment leasing strategy where we're building a diversified portfolio of leased equipment across the various transportation sectors, in particular uh, intermodal, aviation, rail, shipping, as well as industrial assets like gas turbines. Um, we are long-term investors uh, in this strategy. It is focused on steady returns across market cycles. Um, we do invest in going concern businesses as well as, as asset pools. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, we had very limited investments uh, in aviation other than our Heathrow infrastructure investment. And um, all we actually owned on the tangible asset side was a relatively diversified portfolio of narrowbody aircraft spare engine leases. And that portfolio was relatively diversified in terms of engine types, counterparty credits, and lease expirations. Um, that portfolio has so far performed relatively well uh, over the past six to nine months. And we actually expect it to be positioned very well as airlines are seeking to delay CapEx spend related to engine overhauls with a focus on shop visit avoidance. Um, in the past six months, we have since focused on expanding our engine leasing focus, and we've also started to invest in dedicated freighter aircraft. Thanks, Franklin. Uh, Mark, same question to you. Can you please explain Graybull Capital's investment strategy and summarize your investments in aviation pre-COVID-19? Sure. Um, so we're a uh, London-based multifamily office. Uh, we're not a fund. We don't raise external capital. Um, and we have quite a broad range of investment activities. Graybull is the vehicle we use for doing special situations um, distress investments. Um, we are uh, equity focused, so we, we are control investors. Um, and our main uh, area of work is operating companies. So unlike Franklin, who's more on the asset side, we tend to be much more on the operating, on the operating side. Uh, it could be MROs, it could be um, airlines, it could be service companies. Um, and we, we're, we're not, uh, 
entirely focused on aviation, we're quite broad in the sectors we invest in. Our expertise, if you want, is supporting management teams uh, through choppy waters and, and helping them get to a better place, irrespective of the sector. So we invest in uh, industrial space, in, in, uh, in um, hospitality, in, in retail, in semiconductors, etc. But we have uh, been quite active uh, in, uh, in transportation. Um, but yeah, very much in the business of backing companies that are going through some degree of change. And uh, obviously, given what's happened with COVID, uh, our airlines and, and related activities has become uh, uh, very much into focus this year. And we, 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 we suspect uh, in the year ahead as, as an area that we will be investing in. I think the you know our interest in in operating is is really a function of who you know of the individuals here and and our capital. We're not a fund, so we you know we can take more volatile investments. We're you know higher end of the risk spectrum, um, and um, we're you know entrepreneurs at heart more than more than financiers. Um, so we're you know, our DNA is to get. Uh, involved in companies and, and, and help the management teams uh, through whatever they're facing. Uh, we don't tend to have a, um, uh, a life cycle to our investments. We're happy to be very long-term investors or short-term investors depending on, on the situation uh, and what works best for, for all involved. Um, airlines, uh, we, you know, we've done a, a few investments, notably Monarch in the UK, which had its ups and downs. It, it had a, the airline side of it, it had the fleet side of it, it had an MRO, happy to talk about it. But, um, you know, given we do special situations, we quite like the airline industry because a lot of the restructuring work, and we'll come on to that I'm sure later, can be accomplished and completed, frankly, through the transaction phase of, of, of the project, as opposed to you know, quite a lot of companies we invest in, the minute we get given the keys, that's when the restructuring work starts, and that may or may not work. Uh, you know, these are high-risk investments. Whereas with airlines, a lot of the restructuring work that's required to, to put it on a better footing can be done through the restructuring, through the transaction phase, whether it's the balance sheet restructuring, whether it's the fleet uh, restructuring, the route network, etc. So uh, we think that airlines uh, lend themselves to um, better than other industries to, to being restructured. Thanks, Mark. That's all very interesting and clearly shows the differences in investment strategies. Um, Jim and Pete, can you, uh, you know, given the impact of COVID-19 on the aviation market, what sort of opportunities might now exist in aviation for private equity investment? Thanks, Suzanne and Pete. Pete, perhaps I'll, I'll start by sort of talking about um, airlines and sort of uh, other other supply chain companies and debt trading, and then and then Pete, perhaps if you want to talk about the um, metal trading and lessors. Um, so so sort of starting with the airline. I mean, firstly, what what I would say is that that, that obviously based on what. Frank and Mark said it's it's very interesting that and and I think it's clear for everyone that there are very different approaches by private equity and they're looking for really different things but there, there's probably an opportunities that for, for that would fall to some uh, private equity that simply wouldn't work for others but it but it but there there is there is still a sort of a breadth of opportunities and I suppose it's it's our job to sort of really hypothesize based on our experience of other sectors like shipping to try to think about where where some of these opportunities might arise. And so, so noting that, so I'll, I'll start by talking about um, airlines. So, so obviously COVID has had uh, obviously an, a, an immediate and, and, and quite devastating effect on the airlines um, with revenue and cash flow being severely impacted. Um, it's likely that uh, this short term sort of economic shock will cause mid to long term issues for, for airlines. Uh, for many airlines, and, and indeed, we've already seen a significant sort of level of restructuring of, of airlines throughout the market. Um, yeah, 
I suppose airlines might look to source new capital through a, a, a number of different avenues in, in either sort of equity or debt. Um, I think private equity funds are often much more flexible than banks um, and therefore have the opportunity to, to either do sort of e equity or debt investments that might otherwise not be possible for a bank. Um, equity, as, as, as sort of Mark indicated, uh, equity is often selected as it gives sort of them greater control over the business and, and means of steering it back on the right path. And, and so uh, private equity might look at the, the strategy, um, try to improve operational efficiency or, or sort of redirect the business model of the company, uh, divest assets, um, look to further capital raises and, and or mergers and acquisitions to strengthen the position. Um, I suppose, uh, say, taking sort of recent examples, um, Bain's recent purchase of, of, of Virgin Australia out of administration is a, is a good example of, of, of recent private equity investment into airlines. Um, I think the other thing that will happen is, is and, and has already happened, is airlines looking to leverage their fleets. We've already seen um, a large volume of new sale and leaseback transactions with, uh, with airlines looking to sort of raise capital. Um, there are also a number of other unsecured assets on their balance sheet. Um, I suppose the, the equity value in owned aircraft and other assets, uh, various receivables, airport slots, frequent flyer programs, intellectual property, inventory, other equipment, real estate, all of these things will be, uh, may be unsecured and may present an opportunity for rescue financing. And so, private equity might look to these assets or the airline sort of assets as a whole um, as a, a, a means of providing new investment. And, and so to give a sort of example of that, I think, I think uh, DK's investment into Virgin Atlantic is, is, is a good example of that, where they've, they've sort of stepped up to, to provide investment based on and specific assets that are available in the business. Um, Finally, I think it's helpful to add on, on in relation to airlines in the context of um, US Chapter 11, um, there's, there's uh, dip financing, so debtor in possession financing. And so dip financing provides a good opportunity for private equity to invest in airlines on favorable terms and gain preferential security. Uh, a good example of this, I suppose, is, is Oatree's um, uh, reported offer to provide um, sort of up to 2.45 billion in dip financing with others in LATAM's Chapter 11. Um, I, I, I suppose a lot of a, a lot of those sort of opportunities also apply throughout the sort of aviation supply chain. So talking about sort of um, manufacturers, MROs, uh, airports, and and other suppliers. Um, and so there's there's sort of the impact on the airlines has been fed through the entire supply chain and so there's there's really those opportunities throughout those um, when it comes to debt trading and 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 this i think um and, and and as noted from my sort of earlier sort of shipping examples this is where really private equity has has played a big push on the shipping space and and may end up playing a big push on the on the aviation side but it tends to take a while before this sort of washes through and so there's the sort of discount debt trading is of interest and 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 notably in aviation um because we aviation has been so successful for so many years it's attracted a, a lot of what what i like to call sort of sunny day investors into the likes of sort of abs wtcs private placements portfolio financing and and even other more sort of vanilla aircraft debt um where these sort of non-aviation lenders have come into the market and um, uh, and on the basis of the fact that there's sort of consistent healthy returns and and with a sort of little need to really do anything now in this market there's obviously a need for investors to to to, to play a larger role um, and and that often doesn't wash well with some of these sort of sunny day investors because they simply don't have either the resources or the expertise to really deal with these positions. And so we'll often, when things like this happen, look to exit the market and, 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 and add a discount. And so this is where private equity really sees it, um, opportunities. And we've already seen um, exits uh, on this basis from the market, uh, particularly in the context of, of sort of WTCs and, and sort of ABS and other private placements. Um, the next wave really is, is 
what the banks do. Um, I think we've we've heard some rumours in the market already about the idea of banks looking to to, to sell some of their position in aviation, um, and and it's quite hard to do that when when things are sort of early stage non-performing and we don't know whether or not they become performing and that obviously then has a sort of direct effect on the on the sort of pricing of these assets but i do expect there to be at least some element of debt trading and and probably some element of discount on this um it might be necessary because of banks sort of internal credit controls or uh, policy change based on the aviation industry now or or the sort of continued push on sort of capital adequacy requirements for banks might mean that they need to, to offload some of these assets. Um, I think both of those sort of investors, the, so the sort of traditional banks and the Sunday game investors might represent sort of interesting opportunities to private equity investors. Um, so I, th I, th I think that's... Uh, Pete, I, I think it's probably helpful to you for you to now talk about sort of the metal and metal trading and 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 less ore. So I'll I'll hand over to you on this bit. Thanks, Jim. Uh, absolutely. And to kick off on the aircraft less ore piece, um, now nearly all less ores um, have exposure to distressed airlines as a result of um, the crisis, and some more than others. Um, in particular, some of the smaller and, and niche lessor portfolios uh, may even be 100% exposed to distressed airlines, whereas some of the larger, um, more diversified um, lessors may only have, uh, you know, a smaller percentage, sort of 10% uh, exposure across um, their portfolios. Um, you know, whilst we're not close to being out of the woods yet, um, with the crisis, the general market view seems to be that the larger lessors um, have available cash flow uh, and access to debt and capital markets to see out the crisis. Um, but the smaller or more niche lessors with higher exposure to distressed airlines across the book uh, may be in a, a tighter position. Um, therefore, we're expecting opportunities to arise for for private equity investments into, into those smaller or more niche lessors, um, in particular where they have um, asset and let's say diversification challenges um, where they're highly leveraged um, and where they're unlikely to be able to source new investment from their existing shareholders or through the debt or capital markets. Um, now those opportunities um, may come in the form of an equity investment um, into the lessor, um, refinancing existing uh, debt that they have with more flexible payment terms, or um, even the provision of debt with an option to convert to equity. Um, there may also be some private equity and other sunny day investors, as you mentioned, Jim, um, looking to exit from their existing lessor investments as they've grown used to consistently strong return. Um, you know, these, these exits um, may be stimulated uh, since there's likely to be more pain to come for the lessors as they start to feel the effect of ongoing rent deferrals, haircuts and early redeliveries. Um, we'll also have to wait to see the different approaches that the different lessors are taking with respect to impairments and when that uh, flows through into their accounts. Um, those existing investors may be willing to, to take a hit to, to leave the game now, um, allowing the new investments to be, to be coming in at a discount. Um, and then to, to turn to the, the sort of aircraft portfolios piece, we're really we're talking about more direct investments in the actual metal in the aircraft themselves. Um, larger lessors have routinely sold leased aircraft portfolios um, as part of their general business strategy. Uh, for example, placing OEM orders uh, and maintaining a low average fleet age, um, as well as part of their risk management uh, strategy. And, and they've usually had a seemingly endless supply of investors um, uh, for that in the pre-COVID days. Um, during the crisis, um, aircraft trading has largely ground to a halt, although we are aware of, of uh, some small sort of onesie, twosie, and even maybe a a uh, maximum five aircraft uh, trade um, being completed during a crisis. Um, I mean, really, th that, that grinding to a halt has been caused by a uh, limited potential pool of buyers. Um, and therefore, those, those ones that are still able to, to purchase in these conditions, expecting more attractive pricing, um, and obviously that's particularly the case where the airlines are distressed. Um, 
with the current level of uncertainty that still exists around the recovery and passenger traffic, it's uh, very difficult to price these trades. Um, however, to manage diversification risk and free up much needed capital, some lessors will be forced to sell um, leased aircraft portfolio into this buyer's market and private equity funds may look to take advantage of that. Um, aircraft will inevitably be returned to lessors um, early um, in the context of the myriad airline restructurings um, that are ongoing and, and sort of coming down the tracks. And some of those aircraft will be um, difficult to be to remarket. Um, you know, for example, the older older gen and wide body aircraft. Um, private equity often thrives in extracting value from from these difficult assets, so may look to exploit these opportunities. Um, investors looking to invest in portfolios, um, maybe fixed wings, spare engines, helicopters. Um, you know, they can, they can do that directly by employing the use of a servicer, or they might use a, a Joy V or sidecar um, form between it and its established lessor, which I mentioned had been a, a way of doing it before the crisis as well. Um, just, a, just a line on that to say, um, you know, for such JVs and sidecars, uh, you know, how they're done is the lessor and the investor contribute equity to the JV, and the vast majority of that comes from um, the new investor and the lessor has value um, to that JV or sidecar um, principally by acting as the servicer, so providing asset management services and technical advice and uh, leveraging its expertise and relationships in the uh, aircraft leasing industry. Thank you both. Um, Mark, I'll, I'll start with you now. Um, which of the possible opportunities discussed by Jim and Pete, and, and you did touch on this a bit before, uh, would interest Grable Capital? And are there any other opportunities that you think might be interesting? And, and also feel free to just comment generally on any of the areas that Jim and Pete spoke about. Sure. Um, so as I explained earlier, we're looking for operating companies, airline service companies, MROs. Um, Clearly, the universe of distressed companies in aviation has grown because of the COVID uh, situation. So the amount of companies um, that are in some degree of distress is you know, off the charts compared to what it's been in prior years. Um, but distress is not a source of deals on its uh, what The real catalyst for deals in our space is liquidity when basically companies run out of cash. They could be distressed, but if they've got cash in the bank, it's very, very hard to effect a full restructuring and to get a transaction done. And 2020, uh, whilst they are all massively distressed, um, they have many companies have found ways of getting oxygen, of getting liquidity, either by uh, not paying the lessors, not uh, paying the staff, and borrowing off governments. Um, I saw the latest numbers yesterday, which uh, yeah made me fall off my chair and uh, uh, pains me to be a taxpayer. But um, I think in Europe, uh, the governments have now lent 500 billion to corporates in the last nine months. So it's like a new entrant in our industry has just come along and lent 500 billion. I mean, that's probably 10 times the size of our industry. Uh, new entrants come in and written a check 10 times the size of our industry in nine months. So deal flow for guys like us has actually been quite quiet in 2020. And that's not uh, atypical. Uh, you know, we tend to see a lot more activity coming out of a recession than going into a recession. So going into a recession, most businesses have got positive working capital. And as the activity levels reduce, they are able to stay alive by feeding off that working capital. But clearly when the economy picks up again and they need to rebuild working capital, they need to invest in their businesses, that's when they get into liquidity issues. And, um, and uh, that's where our deal activity picks up. So um, what we're seeing in terms of the market at the moment is plenty of distressed companies, but not many that are truly restructuring themselves. I mean, you mentioned the Virgin uh, example, Jim. We were certainly in the newspapers uh, uh, reported as being closely involved in that situation. That was not really a restructuring, well, not in my sense of the word. It was a refinancing where they were able to shoehorn in a bit more debt into that airline 
yeah, some people will call that restructuring. That's not, you know, it's not necessarily what we, you know, it's not fulsome restructuring. It's a, it's more of a refinancing. So I think the restructuring work uh, in our interpretation of the word is is going to come in 2021, 2022, when a lot of these operating companies either run out of this short-term liquidity that's been provided into the market and or are having to rebuild their businesses and just are starved of working capital. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's a, an overview of where, where, where we're seeing activity levels and deal flow. There has been the odd deal, like you mentioned Bain and, and Virgin uh, Australia. Uh, there was a bit of work on Virgin Atlantic. There was some um, deals at the beginning of the year, but they were not COVID related like Condor and Flybee. Um, but I think probably in terms of airline bankruptcies and, and full restructurings, 2020 will be a quiet year compared to prior years, believe it or not. Uh, but clearly, we expect the next couple of years to be quite busy. Um, we're opportunity-led, so we're, you know, the, we think the opportunities will come through um, the whole supply chain, uh, you know, from companies that uh, are not uh, B2C, so they don't necessarily make it to the newspapers, but uh, you know, catering companies, small MROs, training organizations, safety organizations, right through to you know, airlines and, and uh, possibly also on the asset side, lessors and airports, but uh, they tend to be less relevant for us because of our cost of capital. And so they, they'll, you know, th those asset backed companies. They may well be operating companies, but they're so heavily asset-backed, they'll be able to get much more institutional capital uh, than, than, than private capital like ours. And obviously, that, that comes at a cheaper cost. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Franklin, same question to you. Uh, which of the possible opportunities discussed by Jim and Pete and by Mark would interest uh, Alinda Capital, and are there any other opportunities you think might be interesting? And also, feel free to comment generally on the various opportunities. Yeah, Suzanne. So we are not a sunny day investor. Uh, we fall more sort of in the rain or shine investor category. However, we do tend to pick our investment opportunities where the weather pattern is relatively stable and and favorable. Um, so before. I get into the details, we need to look a bit more at the potential, um, when, when we look at potential investments aviation, we need to look at that in the context of COVID-19 and the related fall in, in air passenger travel demand due to the worldwide travel restrictions. Uh, we are currently in a situation where year on year, traffic has now recovered moderately, but is still down over 50% year on year worldwide. And the only area in the world that has recovered somewhat more than that is domestic traffic in China. Uh, international traffic operated by wide body aircraft has been hit disproportionately harder than regional flying with narrow body aircraft. And also uh, to note, half of the world's air freight has traditionally been carried in the bellies of passenger aircraft, particularly wide body passenger aircraft. Hence, increasing the demand for dedicated freighter aircraft over the last six months uh, to move freight volumes. So our mandate does not really include investments in businesses that carry merchant or operating risk. So from that perspective, investing in airlines is not really part of our focus. And even though we looked at the aviation supply chain sector uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, particularly uh, parts uh, leasing businesses, um, component leasing businesses, uh, you know, demand for those services um, is closely related to the assets that those parts support, meaning aircraft. Um, and there is a huge uncertainty related to the recovery timing and the shape of the recovery in air travel. So we currently don't necessarily see opportunities that provide good risk adjusted returns in that particular area. Uh, and when, when I do that, when I say that, we always look at this on a sort of a comparative basis to, to other industries, intermodal, shipping, rail. Um, similarly, aircraft lessors have been hit hard by the lack of aircraft capacity demand, 
weakening uh, uh, credit quality of the customer base and shorten economic lives of certain aircraft types, particularly older wide body aircraft. Um, we do see opportunities uh, with aircraft and engine lease portfolios. Uh, we are very, very careful in terms of how we approach that. On the engine side, we do foresee uh, a general shop visit avoidance strategy by most airlines that basically just simply moves CapEx uh, related to engine overhauls out, therefore increasing demand for, for spare engines in, in, in the short term. And, and we see that um, coming to fruition uh, early next year. Um, and we see that sort of dominating the market over the next couple of years. So we, feel, we believe that that's an asset class uh, we'd like to spend more time on. Um, we've also started investing in, in dedicated freighter aircraft. Um, so even though air freight overall year on year is down, um, the fact that uh, so much uh, freight capacity in, in the belly of passenger aircraft has been taken out of the market, uh, the demand for dedicated freighter aircraft is strong. Many large uh, freighters have been taken out of retirement. Um, and we actually do see that trend continuing. We saw that trend even prior to COVID as a result of, uh, to a large extent, e-commerce. Um, and that trend has not just been, you know, focused on wide body freighters, but also narrow body freighters. So, you know, if you look at it today, um, you know, conversion of seven, conversion lines of 737-800 uh, aircraft are pretty much sold out for the next two years. Um, so it provides uh, so, some, some good stability. Uh, in terms of some of the opportunities that uh, Jim and Pete did mention or maybe uh, just focused on uh, briefly, we do see opportunities outside the aircraft and engine space in the helicopter side. Um, now, obviously, uh, the helicopter market has always been sort of bifurcated between you know, energy-related uh, oil and gas versus uh, what we sort of call, you know, blue light, uh, non-energy related um, uh, EMS, uh, law enforcement, and so forth. So we see some interesting opportunities uh, in that space. Um, the helicopter space has been hit as well as part of COVID, but not particularly on, on the government and, and EMS side. So there is some stability there. You know, we do like the asset class um, and we're, we're actively looking at that today. The biggest issue for us is, is scale. These are relatively low value assets. Um, so in order to invest, you need to actually, uh, you know, purchase relatively large portfolios. Um, so Suzanne, that's sort of my, my take on where the current opportunities are. Thanks, Franklin. Uh, Peter, Jim, did you want to comment on any of that? I mean, just yeah, I, I I think that's all. It's all very interesting, and obviously, it, to my mind, shows uh, a, a very decent cross section of the types of private equity that are available, and and the fact that that both of you are looking at this from sort of different ends of the telescope, um, and 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 really looking to different opportunities. Um, but but as I say, as I said previously, there's a huge huge sort of cross section of different types of private equity that will be looking for different types of things, and and some are already in and sort of interested, and some have yet to enter the the, the aviation market. But I'm I'm sure that that will follow, and so um, my expectation is that there will be a sort of bit of a tidal wave of of sort of private equity play when when the wheels start turning again and. And, and, and really to, to echo what Mark said is, is that 2020 has been a bit of a hiatus at the moment. Not really much is happening. People are trying to put plasters over the issues, but not really trying to deal with the problems long term. And that, that will sort of come next year and, and potentially the year after. So we see a lot more movement there. And one of the sort of questions that I very quickly wanted to, to ask both um, Mark and Frank was, um, it, in terms of timing for investment, and it, given that the sort of the, the recent sort of vaccine news, um, does that mean that there will be a sort of a, an impetus on airlines looking to restructure because now they can effectively create sort of 
decent business plans based on a prospective travel in the future and and therefore that might sort of get the wheels turning on that side of the market which then might lead to to other avenues of investment soon and 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 really in what sort of time period are you looking to invest so is it is it sort of a quick turnaround or or a much more sort of uh, life i think i think frank you mentioned that sort of your your sort of longer period whereas mark perhaps a shorter period do you, do we do we think that that this will um the bulk of private equity will still be looking long term or they'll be looking to cover this short term period while um aviation really is is sort of on its knees in our case being you know private equity uh, control private equity of operating companies um we tend not to set a time horizon uh, on our investments. We have a simple philosophy that if we buy a business, turn it around and it's successful, then either we're happy to hold it and or the exit will take care of itself. Um, so, yeah, we don't, I, I, I don't think we can give you a precise answer to say look if we buy a company in 2021 we want to sell it in 2023 it's so situation specific and i guess the advantage of our capital is we can be you know we we we, we can do what's economically most rational in terms of the exit um in terms of the timing for going into the investment of course we have an eye on you know when's this covid nightmare about to end um but really, that's we, we only look at that from a working capital point of view. In other words, whatever money we put into the company, other than the purchase price, you know, we take a pretty conservative view of how long it will take uh, to get uh, the industry back on its feet. Uh, and as long as the deal works with our conservative view of how long it takes for the industry to be back on its feet, then we're willing to invest. Clearly, if airlines start flying sooner, then we will just deploy less working capital into that into that operating company. Um, so yeah, we're 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 taking a uh, you know dep depending on the sector, sort of twelve to twenty four months view as to how long each sector will, will come back up and running. Um, and then I guess the final way of answering your question is it you know when do we invest because we're not buying stocks which are readily available on the public markets or bonds or whatever we have to be unfortunately opportunity driven so you know we can't really choose the timing of our investment it's when the situation presents itself when the company decides to restructure itself when there's a liquidity crisis or change of ownership requirement so it's you know we can't decide today to invest in and have Virgin Atlantic, you know, it's not in our control. It's when the opportunity presents itself, we have to react and, and decide, uh, you know, how to size the investment um, in relation to, well, in, in relation to the normal restructuring requirements, but also in relation to COVID. Yeah, so, so just following on from Mark, uh, you know, we, we look at our investments uh, from a perspective of, you know, what's our next best alternative in terms of the deployment of capital. Um, and we currently see opportunities in other areas that are much better uh, from a risk-adjusted return profile than most investments in, in aviation. You know, we own a very large portfolio of refrigerated containers. Um, cannot imagine you know what the market is on on these assets right now and most likely for for the foreseeable future um, so most investors when we look to forecast the future you know we're looking to establish trend lines around um, uh, you know forecasting supply demand dynamics uh, you know theoretically you can draw a trend line out of two data points um, uh, you know, but there's going to be a significant amount of uncertainty you're introducing in your outlook if 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 you're doing that uh, with um, you know limited information. So the reason why I don't actually see private equity uh, descending on aviation today is that people are just looking for more data points uh, in order to figure out you know what are the true trends. Um, you know, if we would have had this uh, discussion three four months ago. 
um, we would have all seen, uh, you know, major airlines forecasting a relatively positive travel trend uh, by the end of this year, right now. And frankly, that did not happen. So it was really just too early, uh, given the information we had at the time, to really forecast what was going to happen. Um, so assets aside, you know, if you look at airlines, uh, you know, airlines usually go into restructurings for a variety of reasons. You know, high cost debt, uh, labor issues, uh, um, you know, pension liabilities. Um, but you know, what most airlines have dealt with over the last, last six or nine months is basically an aircraft fleet that was too big for for current and and forecasted passenger demand. And specific to aviation, we don't know yet how the industry will recover. Uh, there is a basic consensus around the fact that, you know, VFR visiting friends and relatives related traffic will recover earlier. Uh, higher yielding business travel will take longer. Um, there are specific sectors like regional flying that will recover sooner. And there is long haul flying in wide body aircraft that will most likely recover later. There are some positives. Um, you know, currently, uh, you know, 30% of the world's aircraft fleet is either already retired or will be retired over the next several months. Uh, and one just has to remind uh, ourselves that um, we need to uh, um, look at this on an asset-specific basis. So, you know, 747s are going to be permanently retired. Airbus A340s are going to be permanently retired. So those are sort of the initial uh, data points that we're sort of seeing with our asset focus that, uh, you know, will sort of help us uh, dictate uh, where our focus will be here short term from an asset perspective. But I think it's still a bit too early to place uh, large bets. Thanks. Thanks, Frank and Mark. That's, that's really helpful. Um, there's a question that's popped up on our, on our feed um, from a member of the audience, which I, I think is really interesting. And, and, and perhaps, um, Frank, this may be more focused to, to you. Um, so are private equity investors expecting higher than normal returns given the current industry risk environment? So practically speaking, theoretically speaking, you should be uh, demanding higher returns. Um, if you're sort of looking at your returns on a risk adjusted basis. Um, in aviation, we have not actually seen that. However, what we have seen in aviation is a flight to quality as it relates to the counterparty to the counterparty credits. So, you know, we currently look at uh, returns in the aviation space that are really no different than the returns uh, we achieved prior to COVID. However, we do so with much better uh, credit quality counterparties. Um, overall, you know, there's too much liquidity that, uh, you know, governments have put into this industry. Um, so the distress that one would have forecasted, you know, six months ago from a liquidity perspective is, is, is just not there yet. And so from my perspective, returns have not gone up, even though as an investor, you should uh, demand for returns to go up. Um, you know, but from our perspective, we have simply just made a, a flight to quality. Um, you know, we're doing business today with airlines that, you know, six, nine months ago would have not needed us. Mark, did you want to comment on that? Totally concur with what uh, Franklin's saying. Uh, clearly, the returns should be greater given the risk environment. I've never in my career struggled to predict the short term so much. You know, we've always quizzed ourselves, what will the world be like in three or five years' time? I can't tell you what it's going to be like in three months. So, yeah, normally we should get paid for that. Uh, but the real issue is, and this is not specific to aviation, it's, it's uh, across all industries, is there's been such a void of deal flow um, because of all these funny money liquidity measures that have been invented. Um, and yet, you know, all the professional managers who've raised big funds need to start deploying capital. So you've got, you know, a wall of capital chasing few deals. Um, 
that will mean the return expectations are lowered. Uh, so for guys like us who are on the less pressure to deploy capital, uh, we're more on the sidelines at the moment because we're not, you know, we do want to get paid for the for, for the uncertain environment we're getting into. Um, and, you know, we're not on the pressure to deploy capital, so fine, we'll just wait. But uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Franklin that, uh, yeah, we should all be getting paid more for, for the uncertainty, but that's certainly not uh, what's happening uh, on the completed deals. Yeah, and, and, and let me add to that just, Mark. I mean, Jim, you, you referred to this earlier by saying, you know, once the wheels start turning again and, and you know, my response to that is, you know, the wheels might still come off the wagon when the wheels start turning again. Uh, there's just not enough data for us to reliably forecast what's going to happen. So it looks like we are coming up on our hour. Um, if you've submitted a question uh, and we have not answered it, we will follow up directly after the event. I would like to thank all of our speakers and Thank you to you, our audience, for taking the time to join us today for our discussion on private equity opportunities in aviation. If you have any further questions on today's topic or anything else related to aviation, please feel free to reach out to myself or to any of the speakers directly. If you dialed into the webinar, please email events at wfw.com so we know that you attended. Later today, you will receive a follow-up email, which will include a short feedback survey. Your feedback is very important to us to ensure that we're delivering events that are relevant and engaging. As mentioned at the start, this is the last episode of the Aviation Series, and also the final episode in our eight-part transport webinar series. We aim to circulate the recordings of all episodes later this month. In the meantime, thank you all, and we look forward to connecting with you in the new year.